All right, back on the Young Turks. Now we've got a really interesting guest for you guys. His name is Patrick Byrne. He's the CEO of Overstock.com. Now you're going to say, well, that's interesting. That's kind of a business guest. Uh, what's happening on the Young Turks? No, he's also got a blog called DeepCapture.com. That might surprise you a little bit. Patrick, welcome to the Young Turks. Great to be on. Thank you. I'm honored. Uh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, what is uh, DeepCapture.com? Let's start by telling people what the blog's about. The blog is about the capture of Washington, D.C. by Wall Street, by oligarchs. There's an economist term called regulatory capture, which sounds fancy, but it just means this. Society sets up regulators to protect us from certain industries, but all too often those regulators actually get captured by the people that they're supposed to be protecting society from, and they, the regulators get turned against us. In that, in that case, they're called a captured regulator. It happens often enough that economists have, have written of this phenomenon for decades, but there's now, there's now a theory called deep capture, which says, well, maybe it's not just the regulators who've gotten captured, but it's the politicians, it's law enforcement, it's some... Oh, the overall system. It's the press, yeah, it's the whole system is captured by the oligarchs. And how, how do they capture it? Well, uh, you're seeing us bail out, you know, rich bankers are getting bailed out by rich bankers on your credit card. That's one form it takes. They capture it by convincing the regulators not to not to enforce the laws. There's been wildly illegal stuff going on on Wall Street for the last three or four years. They call it abusive stock manipulation or abusive short selling. The tools that people use are illegal. They've been illegal for years. The regulators have just really in the last decade have turned a blind eye to it. So effectively it's siphoned money out of your 401k into the pockets of of Goldman Sachs. Well, you know, of course, people would ask uh, Patrick, "What's the motivation of the politicians? Aren't they?" Uh, I know. Don't laugh yet. Uh, elected to represent us, why would they uh, represent these oligarchs, as you call them? Well, look at who. Look at who's giving them. Uh, look at their donations. The financial industry is overwhelmingly the largest donor to both sides of the aisle on, in Washington. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars each election cycle. In addition, one of the elements of capture, one of the things that really explains it, it isn't that somebody is necessarily standing on a street corner with a, at midnight with a satchel of cash. It's if you're a good boy and you're a politician, uh, you're a good boy or you're a regulator and you don't fight this system, you leave and you get, you know, look at Congressman Baker. He left Congress a few days before some new uh, rules went into effect, and now he's, a head, he's, he's the lobbyist for the hedge funds in Washington, D.C. Uh, that, that kind of behavior is very common, especially with not just the political class, but the people in the regulatory apparatus. You're a good boy. You work at the SEC for four or five years and making $120,000, $140,000 as a lawyer. You, if, if you go after Wall Street, you don't get job offers. If you don't, it's very common for them to leave and take 800000 to dollar jobs on Wall Street. And those are the little guys. And then there's big guys like uh, Bob Rubin who leave uh, the Treasury and then wind up getting 100 to $150 million from Citigroup. Yeah, and that's just the beginning. And there's, right. exactly. There's so now, now we're, and we're turning to Patrick Burns, CEO of Overstock. Um, what, okay, so I get the politicians, they get the campaign funds, and then later, uh, if they're good boys, they get paid off. Uh, Billy Causen's a great, great example of that guy who used to be a Democrat and then a Republican from Louisiana uh, does the health care bill that pays off the uh, medical companies and then becomes their top lobbyist for two million dollars a year. I get how that process works and as you explained for the regulators, same thing. Now, how about the media? How, how have they been captured? Well, certainly the New York financial media it has grown inappropriately close to the people on whom they're reporting. Remember this happened in our country in Washington, D.C., before Watergate. There were a lot of journalists who turned out they, they kind of knew what was going on, but the journalists have become very chummy historically with the White House back since the, the, certainly the Truman, day, uh, Truman days and even earlier. So it took two young reporters to break the story on, on Watergate and then follow up and so forth. Well, now we have financial journalists. And the hedge fund beat is really covered by about a dozen folks five or six of them are very prominent, and they set a party line, and no one else will go against it. No, there are non-investigative journalists in the country who will go against the party line as it is set by the New York Times, Joe Nocera, 
by Fortune magazine and such. And so it really just means that there's five or six journalists who who steer things. And they have refused to look. They did refuse to look into some issues until they blew up. Now they're all sort of keeping their head down because they look like such ignorami because they were out there saying, oh, no, there's nothing to this, there's nothing to this, and now they're – so for at least the three or four years that I've been involved in sort of openly criticizing Wall Street, I've brought economists, ex-SEC attorneys, DOJ folks, uh, economists with reams and reams of data to explain to some of these journalists, look, there's this crack in the system, and there's a seismic fault, and it's going to shift. And these people just wouldn't – well, anyway, and it turns out that those journalists – well, there's a small pack of journalists who seem to have done nothing for their entire career but shill for a handful of hedge funds. There's about six or seven hedge funds uh, centered on, I would say, guys. Well, what's their motivation, though, Patrick? Well, I think that it runs the gamut from – that's a fair question. I've tried to be generous to them and say that they're lazy and not the smartest and that so that's forth. That's being generous. That's being generous. There are some. There's one media critic who's now writes for Deep Capture, an investigative journalist. He's become convinced some of these people are on the take because he looks at their stories for 20 years. They've never written a story that can't be sourced back to one of five hedge funds. And then we've recovered a bunch of emails uh, in some lawsuits. These emails have come out in courthouses and such. That, and we publish these emails on Deep Capture, and it turns out – there are, again, half a dozen hedge funds who have such close relationships with Bethany McLean, with Roddy Boyd at Fortune, that they're essentially giving instructions to write hatch a job on such and such a company you and know, then going out and trading in front of it. Patrick, I don't know about the big guys in, in business journalism. I know uh, some people that work at some of the lower levels in business journalism, and one of the main problems that I've experienced is access, that the whole thing is built on access. And it's true in uh, political journalism as well, and it's true in entertainment journalism as well. Since they're so reliant on access to the stars or to the politicians or to these businessmen, they don't want to piss them off because then they'll lose access and won't be, quote-unquote, able to do their job as effectively. Um, I, I see that as the primary motivating factor. Uh, are you with me on that? Does that make sense to you? Well, I'm with you. I think that's certainly one dynamic, but when you read some of these emails and you see how the, the, the journalists are in a subordinate relationship where they're just sort of shilling and eager to please the hedge funds and so forth, it seems to have gone beyond. I think that there's a spectrum of explanations, and one, expl one end of the spectrum is just what you described. And then there's the possibility that they're just a little lazy and so forth. But you, you, as you dig around some of the journalists and you see the absolute consistency with which they have represented a few hedge funds, it's clear that there are a number of large hedge funds in the market who they know what next week's headlines are. They know what next month's headlines are in Fortune magazine. They know the stories a month before the, they, they come out in the newspaper or the magazine. And that's and it gives them an enormous advantage against everyday investors. But yeah, some of the the other ones are going to be just like you say. There, the other dynamic could be that just there are people afraid of losing access. I'm sure, you know, it's a mix of motives. We're talking to Patrick Byrne. He's the CEO of Overstock.com. He's also uh, runs the website called DeepCapture.com. Patrick, you're also a businessman. You know, you're the CEO of this company, a successful company. Have you ever thought, hey? I, since I kind of know how this works, why don't I game the system to get positive coverage, and maybe that'll help my bottom line? Never, never. If anything, I've done things that I knew were – I knew from the moment I started exposing this, of course I was going to develop an antagonistic relationship with the New York financial media and didn't take any delight in that. Never would I try to game the system. And I don't really care about getting good coverage in order to drive a stock price up or down. That doesn't – I don't care about that. Who, who owns Overstock.com? Is it you or is it is a public company? Uh, it's a public company, but I own I own about 30, 35 percent. Other people, it, it's closely held in the sense of probably 60 or 70 percent of the owners are friends, family, people I've I've come to know well. Okay, I got you. And so, because if you had a fiduciary responsibility to maybe the general public, 
maybe you know, you'd have a responsibility to screw with the press to get positive coverage. I never could have a fiduciary <laughs> duty to pump my stock price. <laughs> okay, now which leads us to Jim Cramer, a guy who's yeah. been on both sides of this, the media and uh, the stock market. Um, you don't seem to have a favorable impression of him. Well, I, I had a video that you may have seen. It got public. Uh, I've written about Jim Cramer and a video that, that was taken down everywhere off the Internet, but Deep Capture was, was used recently on a show at Comedy Central. Did you happen to see that? Yes, I did. Well, I just I have a long essay up on on deep capture about Jim Cramer, and I just use all these quotes from his books. And as I say there, it's hard for me to understand why this guy isn't in prison, because he sits there in his books explaining, this is how when I run a when I invest and when I ran a hedge fund, this is how I would manipulate markets, and this is how I start rumors. And there are these bozo journalists that I feed stories to, that I trade in front of, and I doesn't matter if the stories are true or false. And this is how I use derivatives to manipulate stocks and so forth. Well, that's all illegal. It's, I mean, it's so strange to me that he writes about this openly. It's all illegal. Anytime you're doing so, uh, and then there's, of course, this video where he just openly discusses, and he says, yeah, I know this is illegal, but the SEC would never catch on. Now, he never meant for that video to get public. But uh, so I think he's... Where did he, that video come from, Patrick? That came from... Uh, a, something on, I think, the street.com, but it was a members only video that wasn't supposed to reach wide distribution. You had to be a paying member, and even there, I think it was like a select membership was supposed to have access. And how did you get your hands on it? Well, as a journalist, I can't reveal my sources, you know. Oh, okay, okay. We got a members only segment here. I better watch out. <laughs> Patrick's going to come raiding in there, find out what we're doing. All right, so. Uh, look, given what you said about the politicians, doesn't it make sense that we do public financing of campaigns so that we can remove this uh, crazy uh, system that we have where we have the motivation uh, to serve the people who are paying you rather than the people who are voting for you? Gee, I, uh, food stamps for politicians, uh, I don't know. What, what, I, I don't have a very well-defined position on that, but that just sounds like such a bad idea when we do why though look they're going to get the money either way they're either going to get it from the public and then be hopefully beholden to the public or they're going to get it from the uh, private corporations and be beholden to the private corporations well I, my uh, interesting argument it's not without merit my biggest concern is to note that we now have in congress re-election rates that surpass uh, what the soviet politburo had under the Soviet Union. We've become so ossified within Congress to that. So to me, probably the primary measure would be, would it, would it be a system that allows up-and-comers or upstarts to take on uh, and run successfully against Congress? Of course, we have now, for the last 10 years, we've had an, an incumbent protection act called McCain-Feingold, where you can't even, which has made, made it essentially, it's made it extremely difficult to run against anybody in Congress. You know, that you say that uh, you also have some conservative tendencies. What are those? Because right now, all the things that you've said don't really sound that conservative because well, the Republican Party has been taken over by the corporations, basically. Well, I, both parties have been. Uh, I, I mean, anyone who's really caught up, who even is caught up in the party system, I think, doesn't get the joke. This is all beyond. The, the whole party system is broken. And... Uh, now, uh, so the, the, in that the oligarchs own both sides. If you're caught, if, you, if whenever I hear somebody sort of uh, you defending one party versus the other, I just figure they don't get the joke. I am a libertarian, which I've also described as being a Yankee Republican, which is just the way I grew up. You know, it, me, it means that I want a government to pave the roads and put some cops on them and provide a, a you know, minimum fair social safety net, but I'm not stay off my porch. I've seen the Republicans go kind of nuts, I think, in my lifetime, especially in the last 20 years, where they're trying to get involved in making a bunch of decisions for people that they shouldn't be making. That used to be the province of the Democrats. They wanted to run your life. Now the Republicans have. So I guess I think of myself as kind of a, on social issues, a, a liberal Democrat, and on everything fiscal and economic, like an old-fashioned Reagan Republican, although they're the Republicans don't seem to be Republicans anymore on fiscal issues. So right. Sure. Uh, plus, I'm not sure Reagan ever was uh, yeah. <laughs> either. So <laughs> well, He so, wasn't speech. He wasn't speech. You know, the funny thing is I think the guy you're closest to, based on what you're describing, is actually Senator Russ Feingold from uh, Wisconsin. But 
No, no, no. I'm, the guy I'm close to is Milton Friedman. Milton Friedman had it right. And Milton Friedman was right on everything. School choice, minimal government, flat tax. That's, that's where We're going to have to bring you on for another segment to talk about that stuff because I, I, I'm not... I'm not sure I agree with you that that's your position. Okay, well, I'll be look forward to being and to you clarifying it for me. All right. Well, Patrick Byrne, CEO of Overstock.com and uh, the guy who runs DeepCapture.com, we really appreciate you joining us on The Young Turks. It's really my, interesting interview. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. All right. We'll Bye. be back on The Young Turks.